we're reading out of the New King James Version Bible. And uh, if you don't have that version, uh, then read from the screens uh, as we do this together. Romans chapter 5, I'll begin in verse 6, if you'll pick it up in verse 7, and away we go on that. Romans 5 verse 6, for when we were still without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. And here's an amazing verse. But God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more, having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. Father, bless the going forth of your word. May we leave this building in the next 55 minutes transformed. Amen. In Jesus' name and all God's people said, amen. amen. You may be seated. We're looking at the message uh, titled, God for You. And what we do here at Calvary, if you're visiting for the first time, is that we go verse by verse, chapter by chapter, through a book of the Bible. That's the only way you can really understand and study the Bible, quite frankly. And uh, as we do that, the way God wrote the Word is that even though we go verse by verse, uh, the Word of God, the way that it's structured, will have uh, topics that answer the dynamic of your life. Here's the thing that I always look for and I'm incredibly encouraged by. That when we go verse by verse through the scripture, many times people will say, wow, I came and how did you know that I was going through this thing in my life? I didn't know, but guess who knew? Why? Because the word of God speaks that way to us. So I want to encourage all of us when we read the Bible, do not jump around and read scripture from Genesis to Revelation and you just maybe read 1 Samuel, one verse there, and then the next day, Jude, and then the other one, Kings. Don't do that. Get into a book and read it through and watch God speak to you. Why? Because God is for you. And you just saw that displayed incredibly in those verses that Paul writes to the church at Rome. Most specifically, verse 8, which is the the binding force of this argument that we're looking at about being reconciled to God. It says in verse 8, but God demonstrates, makes known, publicly displays his own love toward us and that while we were still sinners, this is an amazing statement, Christ died for us, that he would go through and do that. So in your note taking, write this down please if you would, what we're calling the articles of reconciliation. The Articles of Reconciliation, I'll give you four of them. There must be a rallying point to reconciliation. Reconciliation meaning if we're going to be made up, if we're going to become friends again, where do I meet my friend that has become a foe? In this case, God. How do I rally? Where do I go? I am a sinner. The Bible makes that very clear. God is holy, but his desire for us is to be reconciled to him, made up, a relationship restored, as we talked about last week. So where do I go for that? What's the rallying point to reconciliation? The second thing we'll see is that there must be a unifying effect to reconciliation. What is the great unifier that causes us to actually be reconciled to God? Friends, if you don't know, let me be the first to tell you, the Bible speaks of us, apart from Christ, that we are enemies of God. You may not feel that way, but your lifestyle is that way. You may not have a violent bone in your body, but according to the Bible, your will, apart from Christ, is selfish, self-centered, and will not comply to what God wants for you. Man without Christ is in a state of rebellion. But thank God there's a unifying effect. 
that we hear from Scripture. Thirdly, that there must be a key central element to reconciliation. And that key central element is none other than a person. And that is Jesus Christ. And then finally, we'll see that there must be an intentional purpose to reconciliation. And for me personally, this is the most fantastic. I love, please take this the right way, I love to boast and brag about my God. <laughs> um, I, sometimes I have to control myself because I can get a little um, edgy about it. If somebody stops me in the street and says, oh, I know who you are, or are this about Jesus, or you say this about God, I'm a, I'm a this or that. I'm just going to get right up in their grill, and I'm going to say, de de defend your gods. What you just said, I want to hear about it. If you think that me trusting Jesus for what he did at the cross is wrong, I'm all ears. Tell me what you got. Tell me, give me something better. Let's hear it. And my friend, you can do the same thing because there is no gospel apart from the Lord Jesus Christ. There is no good news apart from him. We need to remember that. And I want to refresh a little bit of the background. This is Paul the Apostle writing to believers in Rome, not a specific church in Rome. He doesn't write to the church at Rome. The book of Romans Paul writes from the city of Corinth. In fact, that's how, if you want to fly to Rome, theologically speaking, you need to have a layover in Corinth, Greece. <laughs> because Paul writes from Corinth, Greece, the epicenter of paganism, to that part of the Eastern, what we would say today, sort of for us, Eastern Europe compared to Rome. Paul writes from that pagan epicenter to Rome and speaks to them about the value of the gospel and the centrality of the gospel. And he's writing to all of these various groups that gather together. What happened was when the book of Romans arrived in Rome in parchment, that was taken throughout all of the fellowships and read publicly to those gatherings. And it's quite remarkable. And this is important to remember. This is what Paul writes from Corinth, the book of Romans. But what did Paul write to the church at Corinth? In light of our scripture here. Mark it down if you would. It's very familiar to most of you. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, beginning in verse 17. Before I read this, church family, don't let anybody tell you that uh, be, when you become a Christian, nothing happens. Now, there may be people who s claim that they become a Christian and nothing happens to their lives. I don't believe them. Let me tell you something. When Jesus Christ comes into your life, he's a gentleman, he's precious, <laughs> he's also all-powerful. And uh, he may come in gently today into your life, but let me promise you this. By the end of the week, he'll turn over the tables of your life. Why? Because he comes in. I like what C.S. Lewis says. C.S. Lewis says, if you give him an inch, he'll take a mile. <laughs> it's been said by A.W. Tozer that uh, he's like a dentist. Jesus is like a dentist. Now, I don't know what you think about dentist, but nobody's saying, you know, I'm having a good day today. I'm going to go to a dentist just to see how things are going. <laughs> you, the guy, your dentist may be the best, best person in the whole world. You avoid them at all costs. Why? Because, uh, as it is said, they never let sleeping dogs lie. They discover that you've got a problem with your tooth that you didn't know you had. I'd rather be in ignorance about it. <laughs> By the time they're done, I don't want needles. I don't want to hear that thing grinding on me. Jesus does that. Jesus comes in, and he starts poking things around. I thought it was fine. And he says, no, this has got to go. In fact, open your mouth, say, ah. And he reaches in with a pair of pliers, and he takes it out, root and all. Jack, we're not going to have this in your life. And you say, Jack, can you calm down a bit? I brought a friend here today. I want them to accept the Lord, but no, no, no. Listen, Jesus is real. He's resurrected from the dead. The Bible is true. God transforms your life, and this is how he does it. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. All things have passed away. 
Now, we still have those old things in our mind, but the reality is God slew them. They no longer have power over your life. My past, your past, we may remember it, but God has given us the power to subdue that. All things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Now, all things are of God, who has reconciled us to himself. This is how he did it. Through Jesus Christ and has given us, Christian, the ministry of getting people to make up with God also. Reconciliation. God has invited you and I to tell others to be reconciled to God. Isn't that kind of cool? I love that. Verse 19, that is that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses to them, no longer keeping score, but has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Verse 20, now then, we are ambassadors for Christ. The word ambassador in Greek is an amazing statement because there's two types of words that he could have used. Paul could have used the word ambassador, which means uh, the U.S. ambassador to Canada. I mean, with all due respect, who cares? For this reason, for this reason, Canada is not a hostile nation toward the United States. That would, be, that would be an easy detail if you are the ambassador of the United States to Canada, okay? That's not the word that Paul used here. It would mean this, that you are made the ambassador of the United States to Iran or North Korea. You say, are you kidding me? Who would want that job? Exactly. God calls you and I, fills us with his Holy Spirit, turns us around, and infuses us into a Christ-rejecting world. You and I are invading darkness. We are invading unbelief. Why? To bring people who are in darkness into the state of reconciliation with God. That's the Christian life. If, it, if your Christian life's boring, you're doing it wrong. This should be thrilling. We should be handing out helmets after service is over because you're going out into a world that they don't want to hear this. It's the greatest news in the universe, but they don't want to hear it. Why? Because they're blinded. We're ambassadors for Christ as though God were pleading through us. Oh, amen to that. Dear Lord Jesus, please plead to the lost through us. In other words, God, if you're going to use anybody, don't use the church down the street. Use us. Don't use some other Christian. Use us. Don't pass us up, God. Use us, please. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. And then here's the punchline. I love it. All of what I just said is based upon verse 21. For he, that is God the Father, made God the Son, who knew no sin, to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in Jesus. That is, at the cross, Jesus took all of our sin, and at his resurrection, he took all of his righteousness and credited it to our account. We went from being paupers, bankrupt sinners, adopted into the family of God by the merits of Jesus Christ. That's why nobody struts around heaven talking about how great they are. It's all Jesus. It's awesome. And we need to remember that, church, in all that he's done for us. But uh, church, last time together, verses six through eight, we saw that God for you meant that from the beginning, he knew our weaknesses. We reveled in that, remember? We boasted in God over that. That your weakness to not match up to the standards becomes a strength. Because the standards that you're trying to reach in your religious pursuits is legalism. That if you just do this and just do that and the other thing, you'll be acceptable to God. And God says, you're absolutely impossible on achieving anything good because of your profound weakness. You and I have no spiritual ability to reform ourselves. Gosh, we don't even have the ability on New Year's Eve to keep the resolution we make. I am not going to eat donuts anymore for the rest of the year. Starting tonight, no more donuts. That doesn't always work so well. We have weakness. When it comes to spiritual things, we are Im impossible to bring ourselves into righteousness. God in our weakness displays that. And he showed us also the value that God values us the way that we are to be valued. 
through the eyes of God. Remember that? I don't need to re repeat that. Was anybody, were you guys here last week? Anybody? What God thinks about you is what matters, not what you think about you. Amen. First John says, if your heart condemns you, God is greater than your heart and knows all things. That's good news. And then we saw in verse eight last time, it's, it's where we actually ended our study technically, uh, is the fact that he knew our condition. But God demonstrated his love toward us in that while we were still sinners, that is in the eternal mind of God, Christ died for us. The gospel truth. So church, we pick it up, verses 9 to 10. Second point is this, he continues on. God will always continue on. And he does this by transforming us. Transforming us, verse 9. Much more than having now been justified by his blood. We have been declared justified by the blood of Christ himself. Now you've got to stop and ask yourself, Gee, uh, uh, Jack, when I, when I see in the scriptures... Uh, Jesus crucified, I know that obviously he's bleeding. He was crucified. You're not going to be crucified without bleeding. We know that they stuck a spear in his right side to confirm that he was dead and blood and water came out. But what do you mean blood? Atonement. Uh, the word, the technical word is propitiation. What does that mean? It means Jesus died on the cross in my place. It means that he was my substitute, your substitute. And when the Bible talks about his blood, this gets kind of trippy. We, we don't have the time to dive into it, but man, we will eventually get this on Wednesday nights in the book of Hebrews. The Bible tells us that Jesus entered the Holy of Holies in heaven, not in Jerusalem, and presented his own blood on the altar in heaven. That's why he's, one of the reasons why he's our great high priest. But can you, can you just begin to imagine that for a second? That Jesus Christ rose again from the dead, resurrected. And after his resurrection, at some point, he had to present his blood before the Father in heaven. On the altar that is recorded in heaven, says the book of Hebrews. And I thank God that my salvation is secure in him in heaven and not on earth. Thank God he didn't do that in Jerusalem. Thank God he didn't do that anywhere else on the planet. Because this world is fleeting. Buildings come and go. And thank God, even on that altar that you and I would affectionately view it as the Ark of the Covenant. Where the blood would be placed on the top. Thank you that it wasn't done by some implement made by man. God had Moses make that Ark of the Covenant, but thank God that by the time Jesus rose again from the dead, there was no Ark of the Covenant to present the blood of the sacrificial lamb upon that device because that device would be lost to antiquity. And then so would have your salvation. No, 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 God does better than that. God says your salvation is secure in heaven where moth and rust and thief cannot break in and steal or take. Man, I hope you know Jesus like that. I'm going to heaven because he's good. He did it all. And then we see also here in verses 9 and 10 that his work continues in delivering us to deliver you. We shall be saved from wrath through him, verse 9 says. For if when we were enemies we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more, you're going to hear a lot of that much more often, much more in chapter 5, much more, having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. This is a tremendous statement. Two times it says we shall be saved from wrath, and it says in verse 10, we shall be saved by his life. See, Jack, am I saved or not? Yes, you are. You're saved. The, for example, the moment Billy Graham got saved, if Billy Graham would have died, he would have gone straight to heaven. But Billy Graham didn't die when he gave his heart to Christ. He lived decades on preaching and ministering for Christ. Your salvation is secure in heaven the moment you wake up to the realization, hey, from eternity past, 
God in his infinite wisdom, my name is there. Look what I see. It's like, you, like the light comes on. You say, well, Jack, is, is my name there? I don't know. Is your name there? Yes. So, well, how can I find out? Repent of your sins, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, and you shall be saved. Yeah. That's how you find out. Now watch, it's so cool, it's so simple, but it drives people nuts. It's so simple, but so complicated. What I just said a moment ago is pure gospel, pure truth. Repent, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, you shall be saved. And people go, oh my gosh, that's amazing. Yes, I need to repent. I, 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 I agree with God that I'm a sinner. I need his salvation. Jesus, I believe you died for me and rose again from the dead. Well, welcome to the family. The person sitting next to you is going, I'm not going to do that. Isn't that amazing? The person sitting right next to you would say, I'm not, I'm not doing that. Nothing wrong with me. I can't believe I came to church this morning. Get all insulted like this. Isn't it amazing? The gospel goes out, and you, I, I gotta tell you, man, the gospel tests people. And by the way, it's interesting that kids, kids gravitate to the gospel so simply. And most adults say, I don't think you got it. You give the gospel to a seven year old, yeah, I got it. Yeah, I wanna, let's pray. Wait, 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 wait. Do you understand what we're talking about here? Yeah. I stole my brother's toys, I shouldn't have done it. I'm a wretched sinner. I ripped off the kitchen a few times with chocolates and candies I wasn't supposed to. And um, yeah, I'm a sinner. Jesus died, rose again. Yeah, let's do this, Pastor Jack. But you're seven years old, don't you get it? I wouldn't be surprised if the seven-year-old comes back and says, yeah, I get it. Do you get it? <laughs> Why? Because we as adults, we get it all messed up. We, got, we make it all crazy. Stand on your right leg, twirl around, do this. Then pray, throw some salt over there, and uh, you know, no, not at all. It is absolutely awesome that what happens is he's announcing to us there is a wrath that is coming. Now, technically, there's a wrath that abides right now. There's, the, there's a wrath of God that is presently in the atmosphere. It's been here since Adam and Eve sinned. If this is a theological class, you would be taught this. What is the wrath that he's referring to? There are numerous answers to that question. Number one, there's what we'll call a general wrath. That God is at odds with humanity, thus we need reconciliation because humanity has sinned against God. And there abides a general wrath. What does that mean? The evil you see in the world that's happening is a result of our disobedience to God. That displeases God and God must judge it someday. The second thing is this, that there is the wrath of man. The Bible tells us that the wrath of man doesn't produce the righteousness of God. Man gets angry. Man will war against each other. Man will hate God. Man will be a rebel. So there's the wrath of man. The Bible says there's the wrath of Satan, which the seven-year tribulation period is very specific about that in Bible prophecy. But then ultimately, there's the wrath of God that is poured out upon a Christ-rejecting world at the end of the tribulation period. The wrath of God. We read about that in the Bible. You've read it many times where in the book of Isaiah, Jesus is coming out of heaven, the Bible says. And out of his mouth goes a sharp two-edged sword, which is the word of God, right? And with that truth, he will strike the nations in judgment. The Bible says, listen, I, do you guys, man, I tell you, if... It just dawned on me, I'm speaking so quick, assuming that you know this, but it's possible somebody here has never read their Bible. You say, well, are you talking about the same Jesus I know? The Jesus I know looks like a surfer. He's cool. He wears a robe, walks along the beach, and all the kids are following him. And you're saying he's got a sword come out of his mouth when he comes back to earth? Oh, not only that, the Bible says that his face is so bright that the sun and the moon flee from his presence, and his eyes look like a flame of fire, and on his thigh is written on his robe, King of Kings and Lord of Lords, and the Bible says that his robe, listen to this, his robe when he comes in the second coming, it says that his robes are splattered and stained with blood. And Israel will say, where did you, what, what's, what is this? And he says, I have treaded out the fierceness and the wrath of Almighty God upon this earth. That's where the blood is upon my garment. 
And that is a remarkable uh, moment in time. I wish we had the opportunity to study it. Listen, when the rapture happens, the rapture, he doesn't come like that in the rapture. First of all, the rapture is not a coming. The rapture is an appearance in the atmosphere. There's no sword out of his mouth. There's no fiery eyes. There's no king of kings and lord of lords. There's no judgment in the rapture. The second coming, the Bible calls it the great and terrible day of our God against the Christ-rejecting world. That's the wrath. But thank God, listen, the Bible says he, we shall be saved from wrath. It's not a reference to hell. It's a reference to the vengeance of God. And that seven-year period is very specific if you know the book of Daniel. But we're, we're saved from this wrath through him, through Jesus. And here's the fun part. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God, that is in the mind of God, that is in the doctrine of God, through the death of his son, much more, having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. If God saved you and I before we knew about him, God, God wrote down in his book, he knew. That gets kind of fun, and you kind of twist your head a little bit. Wait, he knew before I knew? Oh, he knows everything before you know anything. <laughs> that word saved means to bring alongside safely. It's very precious. To ensure, the word means to preserve, to rescue, to recover. In my mind's eye, I see someone coming alongside to be protected. I love how a little kid, when they're insecure, where do they go? They run right to mommy or daddy's legs. Have you noticed that, a little kid? And it's kind of cool because they, they not only run to your leg and grab your leg when they're scared, what they do is they run to you and they grab you and they stand behind you like your knee is some sort of uh, kryptonite weapon or something. <laughs> They are hanging on to your leg and they'll peek out every so often from behind the knee to see if everything's okay. God says, you come to me and you hang on to me and I'll take care of you. I've got this. I'm watching over you. I'm alongside you right now. I'm here to help you. In Mark chapter 4, verse 35, we love this. Mark 4, 35, regarding God's ability to de deliver us, Mark 4, 35 says, and on the same day when evening had come, Jesus, listen carefully, Jesus said to them, that's the disciples, let us cross over to the other side. Now, when they had left the multitudes, they took Jesus along in the boat. <laughs> I think that's a good idea. <laughs> you, got your, you got your lunch? Yeah, got it. You got your life jacket on? Got it. Okay, make sure we're not leaving the shore unless Jesus is in our boat. I like that. Boy, that's a devotional thought if you think about it. I'm not, you, you should be saying to yourself today, I'm not leaving this building until Jesus is in my heart. I, listen, well, Lord, watch what happens. It's crazy. It's awesome. And there were other little boats with them. Verse 37, and a great windstorm arose and the waves beat into the boat so that it was already filling. Can you imagine? They're trying to get the water out. Middle of the night. But Jesus was in the stern, asleep on a pillow. How could he be sleeping at a moment like this? Because he said, let's get in the boat and go to the other side. Amen. You hear that, people? Yeah. God said, let's go to the other side. How, how much can we trust him? Listen. And they woke him and said to him, here it goes, nothing changes in life. <laughs> Teacher! Do you not care that we're perishing? Can you imagine he's sound asleep, he's trusting his father to get them across, and they wake him up and they insult him. Don't you care? Are you prone to say that to God today? You look around, you're in the, you're in the boat, you're sinking, you look around. Looks like you're losing all hope. Verse 39, then he arose and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, peace be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm, verse 40. And he said to them, why are you so fearful? And how is it that you have no faith? Man. You know what it doesn't tell us? 
is what about the other boats? Look, read, your, read Mark carefully. There were other boats. Jesus was in the one boat. Which boat would you like to be in? If there's 10 boats going across the sea and Jesus gets into one boat, what, what boat are you going to get into? Can you imagine? What about the poor people in the other boat? You know what? I think throughout all time, Jesus has said, you trust me and I'll get you to the other side. It's not the boat that's going to do it. It's his word that will do it. Isn't it amazing that Jesus is not here this morning in this boat? The Holy Spirit is. Christ is enthroned in heaven. But he's going to get you. He's going to get us to the other side. And we can trust him for that. Certainly. The Bible tells us in Isaiah 43, verse 2, when you pass through the waters, I will be with you. If I had a boat, I would have that on the back of the boat. You know how people have names of boats? I would have that. That would be the name. Here's, what's the name of your boat? When I pass through the waters, I will be with you. What a comfort. Psalm 34, 19 says, Many are the afflictions of the righteous, God's people, but the Lord delivers them out of them all. God is good. He's faithful. I'm going to give you a string of verses, so write this down if you would, please. When Jesus spoke regarding his second coming and how kind he is to pull us alongside and to keep us near. In Luke 21, 22, the Bible there says, for these are the days of vengeance, wrath, that all things which are written may be fulfilled. But woe to those who are pregnant in those days. He's talking about the tribulation period. And nursing babies in those days. See, what is that? That's a weird thing to say. Hang on a second. I'll explain that. For there will be great distress in the land and wrath upon this people. He's speaking about Israel as a nation regathered into the land. That entire context says that when it happens, it's going to start in Jerusalem. He says that you're going to flee and run. And he makes mention how sad will it be for those who are hindered and weighed down? Why? Because the vengeance of God is coming upon earth someday. It's not right now. The world's pretty messed up, right, everybody? Would we agree? This is nothing. This is nothing. The Bible makes it very clear that when the church is gone out of here, it's going to become an unbelievable place. Jesus said so bad that if I don't come back, there'll be no flesh left alive on earth. That's in the future. Romans chapter 2, verse 5. You guys okay? Yes. Romans chapter 2, verse 5. But in accordance with your hardness and your impotent heart, you are treasuring up for yourselves wrath for the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God. He's speaking about unbelievers. Who? Who? will render to each one according to his deeds eternal life to those who by patient continuance and doing good seek for glory, honor, and immortality, but to those who are self-seeking and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, indignation and wrath, tribulation and anguish on every soul of man who does evil. That's pretty serious, right? I mean, that's serious stuff. This is the word of God. In the 21st century, guess what? There's evil. There's people doing wrong. Isn't it amazing right now? I, I think we're privileged. I got to tell you. I think we're privileged right now. Have you noticed that the issues that are going on in life, media, print, argument, debates, politics, the top issues are issues taken right out of the Bible. The Bible answers directly to those top issues. It's remarkable to me. Think about that. It's not an accident. I think God is basically saying to the church in America, what else do I have to do to get you guys engaging the culture, speaking up? Remarkable. Luke 21, verse 36. This is an awesome verse. Luke 21, 36. Watch therefore and pray always that you may be counted worthy. That worthiness is leaning on Christ, trusting Christ. To escape all these things that will come, come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. Be ready now. But there's a 
presupposition to that is that you know him now. He's going to deliver us who know him. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 10. Speaking of us, that we are to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, who, here it is, delivers us from the wrath to come. Dear friends, I know that this church, you may be from some other belief system or denomination or whatever, that verse right there, that one verse demands the seven-year tribulation period from start to finish, not half of it, all of it is the manifestation of the wrath of God. The first three and a half years is the wrath of God that comes upon people by deception of prosperity and peace. And we never have to be concerned about the wrath of God coming upon us. Understand this, God never, never clumps his children in, in discipline with the wrath that comes upon an unbelieving world. Okay, for example, you already know this, but if, if Johnny, if your neighbor's kid, Johnny does something wrong, and your, your son, Billy, does something wrong, they both do it wrong together, you don't slap Billy and Johnny. You say, Johnny, you better go home and tell your parents before I get on the phone to tell your dad. This is a race. Either you tell them first, or I'm going to call them. I'm going to the house. Billy, come with me. And I guarantee you, Johnny's going to be running home like a rocket. Why? Because, listen, Billy belongs to dad. Johnny doesn't belong to dad. You belong to the Lord. And Jesus took all of the wrath upon himself at the cross for our sins that was owed to us. God's indignation was laid upon him. Remember that. What's left in this world are those who are rejecting Jesus. And the Bible tells us that his wrath abides upon them. That's, a, that's an amazing statement. So how's he going to do that? How's he going to separate who from who? It's a great question. By the way, before I answer that, see what's going on right now. I posted it on my Facebook page. There's a movement now, churches, churches condemning other churches for being pro-life. And I wrote in the post, I said, don't worry about it. Don't, 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 get, don't get all upset about it. This has to happen. God is cleaning up his church. He's separating the wheat from the chaff. He's separating the true from the false. He's separating the pretenders from the followers. This has got to happen. Don't worry about it. It's necessary. And there's going to be a day when he comes and nobody knows the day or the hour. And he's going to separate those who are his from those who are pretending. And it goes like this, 1 Thessalonians 4.13. But I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep or died in Jesus, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, do we? Even so, God will bring with him those who sleep or died in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means proceed or go up before those who have died or sleep in Jesus. For the Lord himself, verse 16, will descend from heaven with the shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Those who you know died loving Jesus. Their bodies are in the ground. Their bodies will be resurrected first. Then we who are alive and remain will be caught up. The word in Latin is rapture. Together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. Verse 18. Get in big fights and arguments about it and beat each other up over this topic. <laughs> no. Comfort one another with these words. One of the great things about a believer is that the Christian says, wow, here's this, this is going on, and we got, and, and, but everything is prefaced in our lives where the Lord's coming back. Live your life. I mentioned this last week. Live your life. Go for it. Occupy till he comes. Get involved. But know this. 
he could come today. He reserves that right. Well, Pastor, do I build this house? We just laid the foundation. Now you just said this. It's not even framed yet. Build it. And if he comes right in the middle of the building of it, awesome. If he comes five years from now, awesome. If he comes right now, awesome. That's up to him. And then what happens? When he takes the church out of here, when he delivers us and he'll do that, there'll be a moment in time, there'll be a generation of believers that will not see death. How cool is that? Enoch was like that. By the way, there's nothing new in the Bible. Enoch, he didn't see death. Elijah, Elijah didn't die. Elijah went up in a chariot of, of fire. Can you imagine? A, a, what is that? The, read, the, read what happened to Elijah. It's incredible. And the Bible says that this chariot of fire swept him up and carried him up into heaven. And Elijah watched it. And that had to be amazing. Wow. But when the church is out of here, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Now hang on to your socks, people. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 5 says this. Do you not remember that when I was still with you, Paul said that I told you these things, and now you know what is restraining that he may be revealed in his own time? Something's holding back somebody. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he, that's a capital H, which means it's speaking about deity. He who now restrains will do so until he is taken out of the way. The Holy Spirit doesn't leave. He steps aside. And then the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord will consume with the breath of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming. I mentioned that in the introduction earlier. Verse 9, the coming of the lawless one is according to the working of Satan. This lawless one, by the way, if you don't know, you can write it in your margins, is Mr. Antichrist, Mr. 666. With all power, signs, and line wonders. That's how he's going to snooker them. People are suckers for miracles, signs, and wonders. And with all unrighteous deception among those who are perishing. Wait a minute. Yep, when the church is out of here, there's going to be a spiritual atmosphere that will exist because God would have delivered his church into his presence, that there's going to be an atmosphere of believing lies and being deceived by miracles that are done by demonic powers, says the Bible. Who's going to believe such things? It says in verse 10, those who are perishing. Why are they perishing? Are you sitting down? And with all, verse 10, and with all unrighteous deception among those who are perishing, why? How come? Because they did not, past tense, did not receive the love of the truth that they might be saved. I'm going to say it, and I'm going to get letters. It happens every time. It's okay. This issue has been debated for 2,000 years. What does verse 10 mean? We know this. That there will be those who will be deceived, and the reason why they're deceived is not because of God. It's because they chose not to believe. Do you see that? Secondly, the Bible says, because they chose not to believe, they did not receive the love of the truth so that they might be saved. They, they are taken captive by the lie. You say, what's so controversial about that? Hypothetically, what if Jesus comes back next week and you're still toying with the gospel in your life? You're still thinking about it. I don't know, no. And somebody were to ask you, do you know the gospel? Oh yeah, the gospel's this, this, this. Think about all the fake preachers that are in the world who can tell you the gospel better than we can tell it, but they don't believe it. When the rapture takes place, they're not going anywhere. You want to know why? Because they didn't believe the love of the truth. They rejected it. There are those who, according to verse 10, if they know the gospel, but they are not accepting Christ as Lord and Savior, they're left behind, not because they, they, they were bad members of the church. They never believed in the first place. And it sounds like 
they won't be able to believe after the rapture happens because blindness will come upon them. Well, I'm waiting to see if you guys go up before I believe. You won't be able to. The judgment for you playing games will be immediate deception. Think about the urgency of that. God is for you. And you look around the world and we all agree that things are messed up globally. I would argue with you that things are falling right into place. Perfectly. Jesus put it this way in John 14. Jesus says, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions, and if it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, here it is, I will come again and receive you to myself. Think about you you hiding behind his knee. He's going to show up. And he says that, I'll receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. How awesome is that? And then third and final, verse 11, you guys, is God for you is forever and ever. I had edited my notes. Forever and ever. It said forever and ever and ever and ever (laughs) and ever. Why is that important? Because verse 11, you know what the takeaway is? Verse 11 says that we have the fact, fact of joy. You can never have the fact of happiness. Do you understand the difference? There is no fact to happiness. Happiness is based on happenings. Woo! You're happy because it's been a good day. Joy, joy is a fact most prominently when it's a bad day. Joy is a reality. Say, I want joy. Jesus gives joy. You want joy? Jesus, the, Jesus is the giver of joy. Can I get it some other way? Nope. Only Jesus. How much is it? It's free. Where do I get it? He's, he's, he's the point. He's, he's the intersection. He's it. He's the one. The joy comes from this, ladies and gentlemen. You may or may not realize this. When you begin to understand that you've been reconciled to God a whole ton of your problems begin to evaporate. A whole ton of them evaporate. Wouldn't you like to live like that? Wouldn't you like to live a little lighter? And the more you walk with him, the more he lifts them until (laughs) it comes down to this. Lisa, last night we, we were talking about the issue and I mentioned it to you guys before. We're still, it's like, we need this. The church needs this. The church needs that. We've got all of these issues. I mean issues. They're fantastic issues. They're fantastic problems. We've got to get either land or a building or a school and it's got to be big. We've got to get your kids from K to 12. We've got to, we've got to rescue your kids. So that's really heavy on us. And, it, and then, wait, we're, we're driving and we're trying to answer. Okay, this is, how about this? How about this? And then I just simply said, how about we just forget about it? <laughs> what do you mean? What do you mean? No, no, no. I don't mean forget it. I said forget about it. Forget about it. <laughs> Where we just say, and I said it in the car, it's Jesus' problem. Yeah. It's his problem. And listen, when, when, when you walk with Jesus after a while... You can do that. Lord, this is the need. We're going to be excited to see how you deal with it. You know what happens? You got joy. There's joy in this. And you don't have to worry about it. There's joy. Psalm 33, 21. Psalm 33, verse 21 says, For our heart shall rejoice in him because we have trusted in his holy name. Joy. The word here, rejoicing, in verse 11. And not only that, but we also rejoice in God. Here it is. Rejoicing means to boast about or boast in. Not in the negative sense, as in self-boasting, but to boast in another. Of course, Jesus Christ. 
to take joy in knowing someone of the utmost quality and character is going to perform, will come through. The word is amazing because it indicates or it assumes that there's a special relationship where you're intertwined with your God, that you know him personally. And it's absolutely thrilling. In 1 John, we're almost done. 1 John chapter 3, verse 2, the Bible says, Beloved, we are now children of God. I hope you can say that. And it has not yet been revealed what we shall be. But we know this, or we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him. For we shall see him as he is. We'll be, a, we'll be like him. Glorified. No sin nature. Can you imagine? No, no more being a creep. No more having a bad attitude. No more, listen, no more temptation. No more, wow. And everyone who has this hope purifies himself. That means get ready. Get ready, just as he is pure. Verse 11 teaches us also, church, that we have access. It's through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received the reconciliation. Underline the reconciliation in your Bible. That means there's no other. And I said this last week. I got to say it again. It's, exclu it's, it's exclusive. The reconciliation puts out all other attempts to be reconciled to God. I'm just going to be good enough. Good luck. I'm just going to try harder. Go for it. It's not going to work. Jesus is the reconciler. Period. Access. The Bible says in the book of Hebrews chapter 4, I'll paraphrase it, that we have a high priest in heaven who in every point like us has been tempted yet without sin. And he represents your life's issues before the throne room of his father. Are you going through something? Is it an ugly this? Is it an ugly that? Is it a mean this? Is it a mean the other? You go to Jesus and you say, Lord, I'm just going to vomit this out. It's killing me. It's destroying my life. And he'll, he's going to begin to speak to you. I can tell you what he's going to tell you because this is what he tells us from his word. He's going to tell you, did I not say, didn't you hear the message today? Get behind my knee. Grab onto me. Just hang on. I got you. And oh, by the way, I'm holding onto you. You making it through is not based upon you hanging on to me. You can hang on to me, but I got you. He's never going to let go. He is theologically, from the heart, fully committed to getting you into heaven because while you were yet a sinner, Christ died for you. Amen. And he guaranteed that through his son. You have access, and here's where we end. The reconciliation produces oneness with God. Oneness. Listen, apart from Jesus, friend, you don't have oneness with God. The Bible tells us that you and I, without him, are in rebellion against him. You say, Jack, I'm not feeling that, man. I mean, I don't believe in Jesus, but I'm, just, I'm, not, I'm not throwing flames at God or anything. Jesus said, you're either for me or you're against me. You say, man, that's not, I mean, you're backing me into a corner, dude. I don't like the pressure sale tactic here. First of all, we're not selling anything. But don't you find it a little strange that we're concerned about your soul and you're not? Let me tell you why we're qualified to be concerned about your soul. Is because we once used to be where you're at now. We thought everything was fine. We thought when we did think, rarely, about death, we thought, well, my, I've done more good than bad. And God says, all you have to do is be born in this world. And you qualified to be a sinner. Well, that's not fair. Take it up with Adam and Eve. <laughs> you can thank mom and dad for that. It is what it is. He came to fix it. I, I saw a shirt the other day that's, you know, when you're, when you're on the internet, these things pop up, and the, shirt, the shirt's for sale. The shirt says, I fix things and I do stuff. And I could see Jesus wearing that shirt. <laughs> I fix things and I do stuff in your life. 
Father, we pray now, while heads are bowed and eyes are closed, I'm in this room, a holy moment. Father, I pray that if there's a man or a woman, a boy or a girl right here, right now, that this message has struck true to their heart. That Jesus died on the cross for their sins and rose again from the dead for them personally. You did that for them personally, but you require a personal salvation for them. I thank you, God, that there's no Groupon for salvation. There's no membership, Costco, heaven package. It's one man, one woman, one boy, one girl at a time, personally. My dear friend, while our heads are bowed, Christians, please be praying right here, right now. I'm going to ask you, have you ever publicly acknowledged Jesus Christ? Does the world still yet not know that you are a follower of Jesus? What about this? What if you're not a follower of Jesus? You're a very moral, very, very upright citizen but you've never fallen to your knees at the foot of the cross and announced to him, I'm a sinner, Jesus, save me. While heads are bowed, again, eyes are closed, raise your hand if that's you today. You're saying, I'm accepting Christ today or I need to go public with Jesus. In fact, let's just do better than that. Let's sing this song. You guys are grown-ups. If you sense God tugging on your heart, I'm going to ask you to come up. We're not going to embarrass you. Just stand up and come forward. And I'm not going to speak to you. I'm not going to point you out. But Jesus, everyone Jesus called, he called publicly. Jesus said, if you acknowledge me before men, I will acknowledge you before my father. But here's the punchline. If today you realize there's a vacancy, there's there's something missing in your life, you're running low, and it's never been able to come together, You've been religious, you've been good, you've been moral, whatever, or you've been a wretch. The Holy Spirit is speaking to every single one of us and he's saying to you right now, it's time for you now to claim my son for yourself. I'm gonna ask you to get up and come forward as we sing this song. If God is speaking, listen, he's gonna be speaking on the inside of you. You got a battle going on in your mind right now, that's him. He's invaded your thinking, obey him and run to the front if need be, but come on up and we'll pray it in the closing. But you make your way right now, stand for Christ. I was watching the clock and I'm thinking, so we're in the red right now. The clock is saying, Jack, you're eight minutes over. And so yeah, eight minutes over, you know what? The whole world is running out of time. Think about that. Every human is running out of time. And you know what's going on right now? These who are going to pray in a moment and accept the Lord Jesus Christ, instead of time being a deficit for them, time running out for them, time time goes the other way for them. It's going to be reversed. From this moment on, what God's going to do in your life is all about a trajectory regarding heaven. You're not running out of time anymore now. What you've got now is eternity beginning today. With Christ, he's gonna go to work in your life today. You'll never be the same. Are you ready? Hang on. Because he's gonna take your prayer seriously. You may or may not feel emotionally anything. It's irrelevant. Do you mean it? Pray this prayer out loud if you would. Dear Lord, I come to you and I ask you to forgive me I receive your forgiveness. I believe you died for me at the cross and rose again from the dead. And I today proclaim Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. And I will follow you the rest of my life by your grace. In Jesus' name, amen. Awesome.